Good morning. How you guys doing? You doing good? Mel? All right. Hey, I want to tell you this. If you weren't awake by our worship, you need to get awake now because we are going to study one of the most intense parts of Scripture that you'll ever study in your life. We're going to study, how many know about the 70 weeks of Daniel? Does anyone know about that? Some of you know? Okay, good. There you go. But some of you, how many have no idea what the 70 weeks of Daniel? Raise your hand. Come on, be humble. There you go, Trini. There you go, most of you. And some of you who think you know, you go, no, nah, I really don't know. But hey, it sounds good. But uh, we're going to uh, be learning that today. And I want to encourage you to really focus, to really pray. Can we pray that real quick? Let's pray and ask God. As we're going to learn, Daniel was told by Gabriel to give, to give skill in understanding. And so let's pray that God would give us that. Lord God, we thank you so much for the sweet time of worship. We thank you for the time of giving of our tithes and offering. Now we ask that, Lord, you would just speak to us through your word. I pray, God, you would give us understanding. Help us, Lord. This society is so ADD with so much hyperactivity. But, Lord, we ask that right now you would calm our minds. Give us the mind of Christ. Let us focus in on your word and hear what your spirit is saying to us. May we get out of it what all that you want. I pray that everyone here, no matter where they are spiritually, if they need to be comforted, comfort them. If they need to be convicted, convict them. Whatever they need, I pray they would leave this place touched, and encouraged by you, that they leave this place knowing you love them, knowing that you want, that you love them just the way they are, but you love them so much you're going to change them more into the image of your son. So Lord, we give this teaching and we ask for you to speak to us in Jesus' most powerful name. And everyone agreed, said? Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. And the title of today's message is The 70 Weeks of Daniel. 70 Weeks of Daniel, verse 20. Now, while I was speaking, and let me give you a background here. Daniel, the 70 year captivity, they had just, uh, uh, Israel had sinned. They hadn't given a Sabbath rest, remember, to the land. They haven't allowed the land. Every seven years, they would give a break to the land. They hadn't done that. And so all of a sudden, now God says, You have missed seven years or seven. 490 years of every seventh year giving a break. So now you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. They're in Babylon right now. Daniel is praying, Lord, get us out of this captivity. If he knows it's about that time, almost about 60-ish, 69 years, and he's saying, Lord, get us out. So here's his prayer to God, verse 20. Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Verse 21, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, now this isn't a man, this is Gabriel the angel, but he appeared as a man, that's why he says the man Gabriel. He is an angel, right? He's the messenger who also told Mary she was going to have a child. He's the messenger angel, archangel Gabriel. So he says, The man Gabriel whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning, uh, be, being, um, sorry, at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, which is about roughly 3 p.m. Verse 22, he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. That's what we prayed for. We need skill to understand. Daniel was praying concerning the seven years captivity, praying, Lord, please let this end soon. Let us get back to Jerusalem or Israel. And God sent Gabriel with a message and it didn't deal with what he was asking. It dealt with something much greater. How many know that? A lot of times we pray a certain thing. God might be saying, I want to speak this to you that's more important what you think. How many know that? That's why we should say, not my will, but your will be done. And so he's praying about the seven-year captivity, and God, through Gabriel, says, I have a much greater thing I want to show you, and that is the entire history of the Jewish people prophetically and the history prophetically for us. How many believe we are in the last days? Raise your hand high. There you go. If we're in the last days... Then how many know we should know what's going to be happening in the last days? It's funny to me how when I teach in Revelation, people were saying, oh, I don't teach the book of Revelation. I'm so scared. How many of the book of Revelation should be the happiest book you've ever known? Because if you know Jesus, you're not going to be through the tribulation. Amen? Now, if you want to stay, you, you can. 
right? If you want to be a mid-tribber or a post to post, you know, I mean, you can do that, but I believe in a pre-trib. I believe the Bible teaches a pre-trib rapture that will be taken out before the tribulation. How many like that? Yeah, and we'll see that that's biblical. It's not just what I say because I like it, but uh, that's what he's showing him today. So verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. I like that. How many know you're greatly beloved? Uh, John 17 says Jesus loves you, or the Father loves you as much as he loves the Son. Isn't that cool? I just read that a couple years ago. I mean, I'd read it before, but it hit me that Jesus, the Father, loves us as much as he loves the Son. It's John 17, I think, 21. Greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Verse 24, here it is. This is the key to the whole thing. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. So we need to learn today, what is this 70 weeks? What does it mean, 70 weeks? The word week here in the Hebrew is heptad. Like a decade means what? 10. It means 10 years for us, right? A decade is 10 years. A dozen means 12, right? So you could say a dozen years. You could say a dozen days. You could say a dozen months, a year. You could say it means 12, but 12 what? Heptad means seven. It could mean seven days, seven weeks, or seven years. Here, as is frequently the case in the Bible, heptad refers to seven years. So when he says 70 weeks, he's really saying, hear this, now you everyone awake? Look at me. 70 sets of seven. Does that make sense? So when he says 70 weeks, he's saying 70 sets of seven years. So 70 sets of seven years. Is anyone good with math? How much is that? 490. Is it up there? Oh, there. No, it isn't. 490 years. So 70 weeks times seven years is, or 400, I should say 70 sets times seven is 490 years. uh, There's a principle for those of you who are Bible students that you should know, and that is the Bible interpretation. It's called the principle of first mention. When you want to find the meaning of a word, uh, any word, you should go to the first place it's mentioned in the Bible. And there you'll find the key to what is usually the, the right interpretation for that word. We see the first time heptad is used is in Genesis, or, or Genesis 29, 27. How many know the story about uh, Jacob and Rachel? Remember that story? Pretty wild story. He, he, he works seven years for Laban. He says, Laban, I love your daughter. And he goes, hey, my daughter's pretty hot. you got to work for her seven years. Now, I love this. This is a great verse. This is a good verse for you women to memorize. It's, it's Genesis 29, 20. It says that that seven years seemed like a few days for him because of his love for Rachel. How many like that? Kind of cool? So when someone says, hey, you got to marry me now, right now, you say, whoa, Love is patient, amen? And that seven years for Rachel seemed like a few days. But here he is. So he's ready to marry Rachel. He's worked seven years. He's all excited. And they do the wedding ceremony. Man, they put on the burqa, real heavy. Uh, it's not like our little veils we can see through. And all of a sudden, they're at the wedding, and he sees her veiled, and he's like, ooh, he's so excited. Gets in the tent, consummates the marriage, wakes up the next day, and who is it? Leah. Now, Leah, if you know, I don't mean to dog anybody, but Leah means tender eyes. That means when you looked at her, your eyes were tender. She wasn't a real pretty chick or girl. I shouldn't say chick. That's not politically correct. She wasn't real pretty. Rachel was real pretty, but she wasn't. Or it could mean kind of cow eyes. She she wasn't the best looking girl. So he's going, he comes out, Laban, seven years I get Leah. And he goes, well, it's our custom. You can't marry the younger daughter before you marry the older daughter. And so he goes, oh, this is a ripoff. And he says, okay, if you'll work for me another seven years, I'll give you Leah, or I'm sorry, Rachel right now. So he says, okay, here's what he says, Genesis 29, 27. Fulfill her week. Rachel's week, fulfill her week, heptad, and we will give you this one also, Rachel, for the service which you will serve me still another seven years. So do you hear that? A week there is seven. He's saying, heptad, serve me for another seven, not days, but years. Do you get that? So heptad, we know through first interpretation, is seven years. When Laban said fulfill her week, the word used heptad, Laban wasn't talking about seven days. He wasn't talking about seven weeks. He was talking about seven years. So 70 weeks times seven years 
is 490. Does everyone get that? Anyone not get that? Nobody's going to admit it if you don't. I have no idea what you're saying. Okay, but uh, just know this is, this is complicated for me. Some of you might say this is no big deal. It gets, it gets intense. Here it is, middle of verse 24. This is what happens during the 490 years and at the end of the 490 years. Six things are going to happen. First, uh, to finish the transgression, that means to finish sin. How many are excited for a day when there's no more sin? To make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of prophecy, meaning to fulfill it, and to anoint the most holy. How many long for that? Now, some of these things have happened, but most, some of these things have yet to come, of course. So 70 weeks, or 70 times 7, 490 years, are determined upon Israel to finish or literally restrain transgression or sin. That is, Satan is the one who causes sin. How many know that? Satan is the one. He was, Jesus said he's a liar from the beginning. He caused sin. But he was restrained. He'll be restrained after 70 weeks. That's the thousand-year reign of Christ. Seventy weeks or 490 years, sin will end. And I long that for that. How many long for that day when Satan is bound and, and there will be no more sin and temptation? There, well, we can still sin, but there will be no temptation to sin. There will be also be reconciliation for iniquity and everlasting righteousness. The vision and prophecies will be sealed or fulfilled. The most holy anointed. In other words, here's what he's saying. The message to Daniel was, Daniel, great things are going to happen at the end of 70 weeks or at the end of 490 years. It's going to be great. And I feel like, I feel like Trump there. It's going to be great. right? They say, it's going to be awesome. Iniquity will be forgiven. Prophecy will be fulfilled. The most holy one, Jesus, will be anointed and received as king. How many long for that when Jesus is king of kings? We always want to, we say we want a good president. How many know we want the king of kings, what we really want? And that's coming soon. Verse 25. Now, therefore, uh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore, now hear that. Here's the key of when this starts, this 490 years. Hear this. From the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, some of you might go, wait a second, we just had 70. Now you're adding seven and 62. Hear this, guys, if this makes sense to you. It's 70 weeks. You get that? That's the total weeks. But now it's broken into seven weeks. It's broken into 62 weeks and then one more week. So a total of 70 weeks. But now we're going to focus right now on just seven weeks and 62. What's that make? 69. 69 times seven is what? 483 years. And this is where you have to stay with me because you go, huh? Here it is. So we just have 490 years minus seven, 483. So does that make sense? Daniel was told 69 weeks or 483 years would pass between the time command given to rebuild Jerusalem... And the Messiah would come. Why now is there a division between seven weeks and 62 weeks? Here's the answer. Nehemiah 2. Don't forget the Jews were in captivity in Babylon for, for seven year, 70 years. And Jerusalem was lying in ruins. But hear this. On March 14th, 445 B.C., the command by King Artaxerxes, a a pagan king was given to the Jews to go back to their homeland, Jerusalem, and rebuild and restore the temple. That's the date, March 14, 445 B.C. Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and others began to lead groups of Jews out of captivity and back to Jerusalem to restore and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Now hear this. How You say, why do we have the seven weeks? There's seven years. I should say seven times seven is 49. Why do we have that? Because, why, why are seven weeks followed by 62 additional? If you begin at 414, I'm sorry, wait, 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 how long? Wait. It took, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm trying to go fast here. It took 49 years to rebuild the temple. Amen? So that's why he does that one seven-week break, because seven times seven is what? 49. So for, when they went back in March 14th, 445 B.C., it took 49 years, and then it took 62 weeks, 
which he took 62 weeks. So just focus now on 69 weeks, so 483 years. But that's why there's the break there for the time to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. That's why it's seven weeks followed by 62 additional weeks. If you begin, hear this, March 14th, 445 B.C., and use the calendar, the Jewish calendar, which is what? Does anyone know what the Jewish calendar is? It's 360 days. Our calendar is what? 365. We're a lunar, or we're a solar calendar. They're a lunar calendar, which is 360 days. So if you take from March 14th, 445 BC, use the 360 day calendar. In 69 weeks or 483 years, it brings you to April 6, AD 32. Now I want to ask you do you know, does anyone know what happened on April 6, AD 32? Does anyone have an idea what happened there? Well, I'll tell you. Now, what happened on that day was Jesus, the Messiah, was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. It was the triumphal entry. He's saying, hey, I'm your king. He came in. This is the only time when Jesus said, hey, you can worship me. Isn't that amazing? Every time he said, shh, be quiet. Don't tell anyone. This time he said, remember he says, if you don't worship me, if you don't say Hosanna, even the rocks would cry out. So this is the triumphal entry. And he's coming as king of the Jews or king of Israel. At first... You know the story. They welcomed him, waving palm branches, saying, Hosanna in the highest, save now, be our king. But within days, less than a week, the fickle crowd said what? We will not have this man rule over us. Away with him, crucified. Isn't that amazing? I want to tell you this, guys. If, when I said to you about worship, and you go, I, I'm just not feeling it. How many know a lot of times your feelings aren't right? Amen? How many know with all your heart you should worship God? So when you go, I, I don't feel it. I mean, you know what I mean? You, you should still worship because guess what? If you will worship, how many of the Bible says a sacrifice of praise? That means sometimes you worship even when you don't feel like it. Remember David said, oh my soul, why are you so downcast within me? Put your hope in God. You, you, sometimes we need to speak to ourselves and say, hey, knock it off. Seek God, crowd to God, love God, amen? And so because in one minute they're saying, Hosanna, next minute they're saying, crucify but we need to do what we know is right, and that is that Jesus desires a people who worship him in spirit and in truth. And we try to do both, amen? A lot of churches, want, they, how many knows? I used to be a Baptist, so I can talk about family. Baptist, all word, all truth, not a whole lot of spirit. How many know a lot of charismatics, all spirit, not a whole lot of truth? We want both. That's what Jesus wants, amen? Spirit and truth, we want both. Here's the proof of Jesus was bummed. Uh, at this, hear this, Luke 19.41, he says, now Jesus, he drew near, he saw the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it. He wept over it. Why? Saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, hear that, your day. He's thinking that they should have known their day. How many times do you remember when Jesus said, have you not heard? Have you not read? How many know, do you ever get freaked out by that? I'm thinking, my goodness, Jesus really expects us to know a lot. How many know he might say that to some of us? Have you not heard? Have you not read? You know, ignorance is no excuse, basically. And he's saying to them, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. You should have known this day. Jesus said, Jerusalem, you should have known that this is your day. Oh, the peace that would be possible if I were your king. But they didn't know it. They didn't know it was their day. Why? Because they didn't know biblical prophecy. How many know God, Jesus expected them to know that from, from uh, B.C. 445, 483 years, that that would be the day that Jesus would come in. That they should have known that Jesus would come. They should have, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees should have known, this is the time when the Messiah should come. This is the time. But they didn't. Hear this. And Jesus, because of that, wept over it. I wonder how many times Jesus weeps over us not knowing the truth or not knowing what is right. Hosea 4, 6 says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. How many know this? We'll spend so much time knowing little sports trivia, little silly trivia that doesn't mean anything this other side of heaven, amen? But how many know we need to know, have knowledge of the word of God? I love that about the Word of God, that it's not like there's going to be a new Bible in heaven. Amen. What you learn here will be the truth in heaven. And so we need to know the truth. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I pray I don't want any of you to be destroyed or any of you to have messed up families because you don't follow 
the knowledge of the Word of God. Amen? That was a weak amen. Hello? Wake? You guys, are you guys following this? It was all right? It's a little too deep? But I told you it'd be intense, right? Anyways, verse 26. And after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. So we've already had the first 49, but now after 62 weeks, Messiah should be cut off, but not for himself. That makes sense, doesn't it? Messiah will come, and yet he will be cut off. He would be killed, but not for himself. How many know 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it perfect? Indeed, he, Jesus, who knew no sin, was made sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of God through him. Amen? He was cut off for, for us, for you. And how many know we should worship him for that? Amen? We should thank God for that. If you say, I wonder what I should thank God. Look at this cross and remember who died in your place. You should have spent eternity on that cross, but he died for you. And so whenever you don't feel like worshiping, you should remember that, that he was cut off for you. He took your bullet. And if you remember that, you'll be thankful. Jesus died for our sins. Messiah came, was rejected by Israel, was cut off for our sins, exactly as the prophet said, hear this, 477 years before it ever happened. Woo! How many think that's pretty cool? Isn't it funny? We say, oh, I'm just not sure if God knows that I need a husband or a wife. I'm not sure if he knows what's going on. How many know he prophesied 477 years to the day what would happen that's pretty awesome. That, that's better. You know, most of the psychics on TV, call me now, you know, $3.99 a minute. Most of those people, they have a 50-50 shot, just like you, if you guess. They're about that accurate. And you pay them three ninety. well, hopefully you don't pay them, but people pay them $3.99 a minute, right? Hear this. Your God knows exactly what's going on with your life. I used to say to God, did you lose my file? I didn't get married until I was 32. Did you lose the file? Did you forget? Is there no girl crazy enough to marry me? And then God brought me down. Okay, just easy. But you know, I was like, I was just like, you know, man, I was freaking out. But God is good. He's in control. And know that he prophesied this to Daniel 477 years before it ever happened. Middle of verse 26. Is that cool to you guys? Is that just me? That's pretty cool, I think. Middle of verse 26. And the people of the prince, this is not talking about Jesus anymore, I'm just going to give you a hint. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now remember what Jesus said? They look at the, 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 the temple and he says, not one stone shall stay. It's going to be destroyed. And what happened? 70 AD, Titus came in to the Romans and destroyed it. This is prophesied 515 years before it ever happened. How cool is that? The prophet is saying this, even before Jesus, saying it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. Um, at the end of it, middle of verse 26, at the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of war. Desolations are determined. Determined. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, so do you get this? Let's make it simple. We had 69 weeks. 69 times 7 is 483 years. That's already passed. That's already happened. Amen? That was from 49 years to rebuild the temple. Then the rest, I don't know what that is. The rest, so 483 years from the start to rebuild the city and the temple to Jesus dying was 483 years. But hear this. We have one week left. We have one seven-year period left. Okay? So there's where we are now. One seven-year period here left. After 69 weeks times 7, 483 years, Messiah came. But there is still one week left, and history of Israel consists of 70 weeks. Therefore, one year period remains to be unfolded. Verse 26 again. I like how the old King James says it. The prince of the people. How many know this? Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. Paul called him the small g God of this world. How many know those who don't know Christ? How many know who's their father? Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? You're of your father, the devil. So when it says the prince of the people, he's not saying God's people. He's saying the prince of the world, basically. The prince of the people. Antichrist, who will be a charismatic, influential, intelligent world leader, will appear on the scene. The people will say, you're the one. You're the one we've been looking for. Lead us. How many know we're in that state? Amen. How many know that? 
right? Did you, did you hear? I heard, I don't know who it was. I heard some actor. I always love when actors talk about politics. They said, this is a pretty sad time where he says people are voting the two most least candidates ever in history of our country. Did you know that? I didn't know that. These are the most unpopular candidates. And so now people are voting for them because I just I hate the other one worse. Amen? I mean, isn't that funny? Both parties are saying, will they support, you know, will the, will the Bernieites support the Hillary and Hillary support Bernie? And will Trump support, you know, will, will the Republicans support Trump? Amen? And so how many know we're looking for a real amazing leader, right? We're looking at someone like, here I come to save the day, right? I mean, we... <laughs> Sometimes, now I was happy with the Republicans. I was happy we had, we started off with a pretty good bunch of guys. Remember, I think, it, I forget how many elections ago, or maybe it was the last time, we didn't have anybody. Amen, hardly at all. But now, you know, I mean, uh, we have some pretty cool guys rising up, so that was pretty exciting to me. But now we're with Trump. Amen. <laughs> and, and how many know this? I want to just say this to you. Uh, I, 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 well, I better be careful. I'll be in trouble here. I, I'll get arrested. But, you know, how do we know that, that Trump isn't our answer? Amen. He might be better than someone else, but he isn't our answer. Amen. Because how do we know comb over an orange face is going to probably do some things we don't like? How do we know most presidents get very wealthy when they become president? How do we know Trump will not probably leave being not 10 billion worth, or 10, he'll be worth like 50, he'll own the country basically. Amen. It's going to be crazy. And so just know that. Amen. Know that the answer is Jesus, amen? Now, I'm not saying don't vote for anyone. I'm not saying vote. you got to vote for someone who will best represent your values, amen? And, and I'm thinking this other candidate, I won't say his name, <clears throat> Bernie, but um, is when you're talking about 85% tax, how many would have a problem with that? Okay, <laughs> so vote logically, okay? Vote biblically. Vote, vote no, I'm just kidding. Vote. You know, but anyway, I'm just kidding. I didn't say it, so it doesn't count. But anyways, so there you go. Oh, golly. Where am I? Help me, Lord. Uh, okay. Answer Christ will come to the scene. He'll negotiate a treaty. He'll solve, hear this, the Middle East problem. Ingeniously including a way that the temple, hear this, will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Now, some of you might say, but Pastor Craig, isn't there a little thing called the Dome of the Rock? Isn't there a temple on the temple site? A little gold with a gold roof, and it's a it's a it's a Muslim mosque. It's the third most holy place in the Muslim site. I mean, what's going to happen there? Now it's so funny. You ask the Jews and part of the temple temple institute, and they're getting all the instruments ready to have the new temple, and they have everything. They even got the ashes of a red heifer ready because they have to use that to cleanse all the instruments. So everything's getting ready. But hear this. So I remember getting with the head guy, I forget his name, Omar, I think, I, I, I forget his name, something, Rabbi something, but he says, I say, so what about that? And I was all alone with him, and he looks around like, so you really want me to tell the truth? And I say, well, what about that little dome there? And he says, it must be removed. Now, how many know that it isn't going to be removed without trouble? Amen? It's not going to be people. Even when they took in 67 war, even when they took the Temple Mount, they gave it back to them because they knew it would cause a World War III and they knew, hey, let's let them have the Temple Mount. Now they still control it, but they let them have it. Okay? So hear that. So they're probably, I, I, I would say I don't see them blowing up the Dome of the Rock. Okay? That would be trouble that they don't need or want. But hear this. Archaeological, Christian archaeologists, sorry, they've made discoveries in recent years that have unmistakably confirmed that the temple was a little bit north of the Dome of the Rock. I've told you this before, but if some of you are new, hear this. And interestingly enough, the space where, it is, where the actual temple sat is blank. The Dome of the Rock Mosque sits on the outer court of the old temple. The outer court of the temple was an area where the Gentiles could come and kind of look at the temple, but they couldn't go in. Hear this. Revelation 11.2 says this. Mark out or set off the court of the Gentiles. Set it out apart. Set it away because why? And you'll see. And I even got my little pointer. Look at this. I'm so excited. Get a little laser. Look at this right here. Let me show you something. I'm going to get feedback. You see this right here? There's the Dome of Rock. Now hear this. Right here is Eastern Gate is over here. It's like I wish I could have got a straighter picture. But the Eastern, can you see? I'll go over here to the other side too. But right here is the Eastern Gate, right? This is the Mount of Olives over here. 
Eastern Gate. This is, this is east. This is north. This is uh, west. And this is south. There you go. And so here we go with the Dome of the Rock. We'll hear this right here. You see where A is? That's called the uh, Dome of the Spirits or Dome of the Tablets. That's where they believe the Ark of the Covenant was. So hear this. Do you see? Now here's Antichrist. He'll make a covenant to build a wall and build the temple right here. So the temple has room. There's plenty of room to build the new temple exactly right where. That was where the Holy of Holies was. That's where the Ark of the Covenant. Remember Raiders Lost Ark? Right there. Uh, there. And so there it is. Is that cool? And hear this to prove that this theory is true too. Is they said in the Talmud, which is a, a, the Jewish book of writings, they said you could look out the door of the temple and see the eastern gate. Well, if you look, go look at home if you can get a better picture of this. I, I didn't want to take a whole lot of time. If you go outside the door here, the, the, the eastern gate is over here. So, right, it's perfectly aligned with this dome of the, spir of the spirits right there. So there's the eastern gate if you go out to the Mount of Olives. Isn't that cool? It's almost like God knows what he's doing. It's just weird. You know, it's just amazing. Did everyone get that? So there it is, Dome of the Spirits. So there it is. A is Dome of the Spirits. There's Dome of the Rock. They say, here's the Temple Institute's over here. They say it must be to remove. Not going to happen. Antichrist, most theologians believe, is going to build a new temple, build a wall, and they will be like Coke and Pepsi getting along together. How many know that would be pretty amazing if, if how many know Antichrist would be the man if he could do that? And think about it. If anyone could do it, it would be the Antichrist because he's the prince of the people. And say, so guess what? You know, there's only one way to God. And so who is the prince of the dome? The enemy. And the enemy will get them to say, hey, let's build a temple next to it. How many know that makes a lot of sense, does it not? Amen? No? Okay. Orthodox Jews today say this. Here, this is where it gets scary. Orthodox Jews say, and I've heard them say this, that they say they'll recognize their Messiah as the one who rebuilds their temple. See how vulnerable they are? Because they're going to they're gonna say, hey, you can rebuild as a temple. You can go on site, go to temple, go to uh, templeinstitute.com, and you'll see the temple. And they're raising money to build the temple. Now hear this. The temple only costs probably right now about $3.5 million to build. How many of Jewish people are very wealthy? That, the money is not an issue. They have it. They have everything almost ready. I don't know if they have the, the ashes of the red heifer yet, but they're working on it. They have to do that to cleanse all the instruments, and they have to make it. I don't know what they're going to do with the ark. I didn't have a chance to ask them about that, but everything's ready. They're just waiting for somebody who can get them their land back and get part of the temple. Amen? But they say they'll recognize the Messiah as the one who rebuilds the, the temple. Antichrist, will fulfill, he'll fit the bill. But in the middle of his seven-year, remember we have one last week, seven years left. In the middle of his seven-year treaty, Three, three, three and a half years. Remember this. There's a tribulation, but the first three and a half years are the tribulation period, and the second three and a half are the great tribulation. Because the first three and a half years is this right here, the deceit of where the Antichrist is saying, hey, I built your temple. Hey, I'm, a G I'm for you guys. I I'm for everybody. And he'll be a hero for the first three and a half. Oh, there'll be craziness going on, but it really gets crazy after what we're going to read right now. But in the middle of the seven-year treaty, Antichrist, his true colors will show. He'll go into the new temple, cause the sacrifice to cease, stop the sacrifices, and set up an image of himself. And hear this, demand to be worshipped. How many know Antichrist? Hear this, some people have said to me, oh, well, you know, I want to go through the tribulation because then I'll know God's real and I'll, I'll really, I'm willing to die for God. I always say, I love what one pastor said, if you can't live for Christ in life situations, how are you going to be foolish enough to think you can live in the death situations? Amen? Because you are not going to be able to buy or sell without the mark on your head or on your right hand. And you will have to. The mark won't just be a, a little stamp to buy stuff. It'll also be a form of worship because to do this, you have to worship the image. You have to worship. And if you will not worship that image, then here's what happens. Matthew 24, 15 calls this the abomination of desolation. When the Antichrist will set up an image of himself in the temple, say, worship it. When this happens, the Jews, the true Jews, will say, what have we done? How many know I forget, was it Zechariah? Where is it, the verse where, where Jesus says, they say to him, where did you get those wounds? And he said, I got them in the, in, the, in the house of my friends. How many of the Jews will realize, oh my goodness, you were the Messiah. We missed you. 
Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And they'll realize, what have we done? Realizing this, the Jews will no longer go along with his program of false peace. Antichrist will then wage war against Israel, all the Jewish people that will not follow him. And he'll also hear this wage war against everyone who comes to know Christ during the tribulation period. He'll wage war because they will know what? Not to take the mark. For three and a half years, he will literally break hell on earth, on the planet. Now hear this real quick. This is what's so wild. People say, well, why would we not, why would we uh, be raptured out of the tribulation? Because hear this, this is not just, how many know, when we're raptured, Satan is going to go hog wild on the earth. You know that, right? He's going to be crazy because no one will restrain him. It says the restrainer will be taken out. Christ in us will be taken out. The Holy Spirit will still be working here because people get saved. But guess what? He'll be taken out. But hear this. It isn't just Satan going crazy on the earth or wild. It's God. Because Revelation 6 says that what happened, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're in the age of grace. How many know that? This is a time for you to be sharing with your friends. This is a time for people to get saved. But how many know? And that's what happened. As soon as Jesus died, the 69 weeks, 483 years, pause button. How many know we're in pause right now? We have one week left, and there's been a gap, about 216 years. A gap. But what happens? That button is going to press again once the church is taken out. But hear this. Why? This will be God pouring out his wrath on a what? Christ-rejecting world. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, make sure you know Jesus. Make sure you surrender your heart to him. Make sure you worship as if your life depended on it. Amen. And we'll see that in a second. We'll see because how many know we've been taught, pray a prayer, it's cool, don't matter how you live, just pray a prayer, do whatever you want. How many know that's not true? Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. It's not true. Just pray a simple prayer. Because remember what I told you? Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus said, in the last days, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. But he'll say what? I'll never know you. Do you know that word many there means more than half? That means more than half of the people who say to you, I'm a Christian. I received Jesus. More than half of them will hear from God, depart from him, never knew. Now hear this, guys. Only you or God know the truth. Amen. Because the Bible says his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. So if you're going, I'm not sure if we're children of God, then you need to surrender. Amen? And how many know this? If you're not sure, get on your knees, get on your face and say, God, I surrender my life. And guess what? Like I told you when I said, God, I feel so unworthy. This sermon's going to be so intense. People are not going to laugh. They're going to look at me weird like they're doing right now. And, you know, and I just said, and God just said, I love you. Even if you can't teach this, I still love you. And we need to know that. We need to know that we're in Christ. We need to hear his voice. But finally, at the end of the seven-year tribulation of Daniel's 70th week, Jesus will come back. I'm excited about that. We're going to come back with him riding on white horses. For those of you women, you know, Amy, white horses, you get your horse back. You know, riding, it'll be great. And we're riding with him. Seven years come back, and we'll rule and reign the earth for a thousand years. Satan will be bound, and then he'll be released for a little bit, but, he'll come, but, but then he'll be thrown forever in the lake of fire. He'll reign, will rule and reign on the earth of them. This, thus, with the 70 weeks of Daniel, excuse me, complete, there will be an end to sin and the beginning of everlasting righteousness. Oh, I long for that. The most holy will be anointed, and we will have already seen, as I said, the first 69 weeks have come to pass. It's already been done. So here's this. When will the 70 week, the 70th week begin? When will this last seven-year period begin? How do we know? Anytime. There is nothing that needs to happen. So hear that, guys. Hear that. If you believe that, and, and it's, well, it doesn't matter if you believe or not, it's the truth. But hear this. 1 John 3, 3 says, all, these, all those who have this hope will purify themselves just as he is pure. Why? Because you know he can come back in a second. And you've heard the old worldly saying, you don't want to get caught with your pants down. Amen? So we want to be ready. Because there's nothing that happens. It's not like you're going to get a weak warning. Oh, Jerusalem, you know, Antichrist came. We're not going to be here. You have no warning when the rapture comes. And that's usually most scholars would say the start of this last seven years or the seventh week of Daniel. But before it does, Jesus will call us up to heaven in the rapture. How many long for that? I'm so excited. Twinkle of eyes. How many of you don't have time to get ready? It's a twinkle of eyes. How fast your eye twitches? So if you have tremors or, you know, that's how fast. Can you get that ready in that time? Huh? No. So you better be ready all the time. Because if you're, you have to be quick if you can be ready. You know, it'd be like Muhammad Ali, spoke like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You know, I mean, you better be quick. 
But how many know it's just better to be ready all the time? Because we are definitely living in the last days. We're definitely living in the last days more than they were 50 years ago. And so we need to be ready. But before it does, Jesus will call us up in heaven. For seven years, we'll, have, we'll get to know him, have a honeymoon with Jesus. We'll have the marriage supper. We'll just be hanging out, eating. I love having eating. Isn't that good? And you won't have to worry. I don't have to hear my wife, honey. You know? How many of you I believe all the bad food will be good food in heaven, and tofu will be bad. Amen? Yes. You can clap. Praise the Lord. Yes. It's going to be good. Uh, trust me. Fried chicken is going to be the new tofu. It is going to be awesome. But anyways, <laughs> the church, hear this, was not in Daniel's first 69 weeks. The church wasn't there. So neither shall the church be in Daniel's 70th week. Amen? That's why Jeremiah calls this time the tribulation. He calls it what? Jeremiah 30, verse 7. He says the time of Jacob's trouble, Jewish trouble. I love this. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but it's really cool. One commentator said this. I think it was J. Vernon McGee, beloved. But he said, Enoch is a picture of the church. Remember Enoch? He walked with God and was no more. That is the rapture. The Jewish people, or the people who were in the flood, that's the people who are not ready for the tribulation will be destroyed with the Antichrist. But how many know the Jews, Noah, in the boat were spared in, during the time of the tribulation. I mean, that's a picture of the Jews that come to know Christ in the tribulation period, the tribulational saints. How many like that? Get a picture? You see that? So that's, that's what I believe the Bible teaches. You know, like I said, if you want to stay for the tribulation, I'm sure if you pray hard enough, maybe God will let you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, no. but anyways, what separates Daniel's 69th week from the 70th? It's the period of time known as, I said, the church age or the age of grace. Now, what does Daniel's prophecy mean to us personally today? So often I come to the Lord talking like, like Daniel about the seven years of captivity. Oh, Lord, get me out of this. Get me out of that. But I end up leaving my time of prayer with an entirely different perspective on eternity. How many know that God does that sometimes? What you're worrying about, God says, don't worry about it. Focus on this. And that's what he did to Daniel. Uh, you know, I can be concerned why this person doesn't like me or why this job didn't work out for me or why this building paid on time or why sometimes a church is in a deficit. But the Lord will say to me, I want to talk to you about heaven. I want to talk to you about eternity. How many know that if you believe that eternity is coming back soon, how many know you won't worry as much? Because you remember, I, I love this. C.S. Lewis said this. This is good. I love C.S. Lewis. I wish I was half as smart as C.S. Lewis. He says, if you focus, if you shoot for the heaven, if you focus, if you focus on heaven, you'll get the world. Two. If you focus on heaven, you'll get the world too. But if you focus on the world, you'll miss heaven and earth. I want to say I hate the saying that says, don't be so heavenly minded as you'll know earthly good. How many know it's only when you'll be earthly good is when you're heavenly minded? Because you'll know that this is, you know, Trump is not the answer. You know that even if Bernie gets in, God can still work it out. Amen? I think some, I heard some people say, I want Bernie to get in because then we'll go back sooner, right? The Lord will come back sooner, right? I mean, you know, I don't know if I'm quite there yet, but uh, you know what I mean? But it, you get my point? If you're living for eternity, you're relaxed because you know God isn't, you're, this world is not your home. You're, you're a pilgrim, as it says in Hebrews. You're passing through. That's why reading the Bible and praying is so important in knowing prophecy. We need to be reminded of the big picture, and that is that eternity will be here before we know it. I was thinking about Muhammad Ali. Do you, do you realize that Muhammad Ali is a Muslim? Does it hit you that Muhammad Ali is probably not in heaven right now? It just hit me. And so, so arrogant. Remember old Muhammad Ali? I'm the greatest. How many know he's realizing today he's not? The greatest. Unless he did a conversion that I didn't know of. But how many know that should break our hearts? Because we're celebrating him as, oh, yes. But how many know there's not a real celebration in his eternity right now, probably? And I don't say that to condemn hearing me. So, oh, God. Do you hear my heart, though? We need to be ready for eternity. 
because it's going to come. How many know? I don't think, I don't think Muhammad Ali walked in that hospital or whatever, was wheeled in that hospital and said, today's the day I'm going to go home. He's probably, I'm the greatest. I'll never die. I don't know. But how many know this? You don't know. You walk, you don't know if you drive out of here, try to do our funky turn, and I'll. <laughs> so, again, it's good to live right. It's good, and that's why, guess what, guys? I know I bug you. I know I do. And you go, amen. You can say amen to that. I bug you. But hear this. I will never apologize for encouraging you to be ready for God. I'll never encourage, feel bad of encouraging you to worship God with all your heart. And guess what? I feel like I want to put this saying up here on our board. The beatings will not stop till worship improves. <laughs> so figure it out. So you go, uh, what? Can I just say this real quick? i got to say this. We were praying Friday night, and all of a sudden, Kevin, I'm going to blame Kevin. But Kevin, you know, he was, he was crying like a baby. But anyways, no, I'm just kidding. But he was crying, and he said something to me. We were all crying. And he said, he goes, you know, he goes, Lord, help me. I have this obstinate spirit. I have this rebellious spirit that when someone tells me to do something, I just go, no. Anyone else relate to that spirit? <laughs> oh, Pastor Craig told me to tithe. I was going to, but now you said do it. I'm not. What is it in us that's that way? Do we need Jesus or what? Oh, you told me to, so I can't. Told me to raise my hands. Can't do it now because you told me I was going to, but you messed it up. (laughs) Come on, people. You got to say, is what that person's saying right? If it's right, I should do it. Not, he told me to, I can't. Do you know the Bible says in Proverbs, the pride of a man will bring him low? Do you know the Bible says if you, if you get rebuked, he says if, if you remain stiff-necked after many rebukes, you'll be broken beyond remedy. So when you hear me or hear Mariah or hear Morgan or hear someone say, come on, guys, worship the Lord, don't go. Yeah. <laughs> say, and ask them, why, why do I go? No. I don't think it's the Lord. It's the enemy. It's our flesh. And It's our rebellious society that wants to rebel against anything that someone says to do. I should almost tell you, do not worship the Lord. Don't worship him. (laughs) Don't say amen. Amen. All day long. (laughs) Jesus said this in Luke 21, 36. is what I was saying earlier. He said, watch therefore and pray always. Notice he didn't say it one time. Just pray a prayer. He says, Luke 21, 36. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all the things that will come to pass. Do you know what that's saying? That's saying pray. Rapture right now. The rapture. No, <laughs> that's a warning. No, but pray that you may be counted worthy to escape the things to come. Do you hear that? He didn't say, pray to receive me and it'll be all good. He said, here's Jesus talking to you. He says, watch, therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy. Can I add to this? Can I craigonize it? That you may be ready for my return? Because we think, oh, I have plenty of time. Young people always think, oh, I, what do you say? I have plenty of time to get right with God. <laughs> plenty of time. I have plenty of time. Really? Really? So he says, therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all the things that will come to pass. I love this. People say, you know, you pre-trib rapture people. All you do is want to escape, just escape pain, escape the tribulation. When Jesus tells you to escape, it's good to escape. Calgon, take me away, right? I mean, escape. We should want it. Jesus says to pray for it, that you'll be counted worthy. But hear that, guys. It's saying live right. So that you know, that you know, that you know that you're in heaven, that you're, that you're Christ. Because how? You will know them by their fruit. Not by what they say. Oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian tree. No, you'll know them by their fruit. A good tree did not produce bad fruit, and a bad tree did not. You'll know them. That doesn't mean we never mess up. But if you're constantly messing up, constantly living for yourself, you have to go, am I really a good tree? This is popular stuff, isn't it? Pastors say this all the time, don't they? Pastor said, you're good. God loves you just the way. Don't change a thing. Hmm. Okay. So what's the answer? We need to make a choice today to be eternally minded and to live like God could come back at any moment because that is the truth. Amen? That makes sense to you guys? Still love me? Love God more? Amen. 
you'll worship the Lord if I say, put your hands up? Yeah. All right. Thank you. I love this one comedian. i got to say this. One comedian said this. He goes, how many of you go for, to a church? It's uh, Tim Hawkins. How many of you go to a church where you raise your hands? And all of you raise your hands. Then he says, how many of you go to a church where you don't raise your hands? Raise your hand. And he, uh, he starts laughing because they raised their hand. <laughs> no, I know. It's kind of funny. Anyway, you'll get it later in the parking lot. But uh, we're going to take communion right now. And I want to just say this. We serve open communion. All you need to do is just make sure you're right with God. Just like that prayer. Pray, therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy. Jesus, or Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, if you take communion lightly, if you have unconfessed sin, you just kind of take it as like, God, oh, it's just bread, it's just juice, no big deal. How I many there's something very spiritual about communion? I don't believe it becomes the actual blood embodiment like they, when I was a Catholic. But how many know there is something very spiritual. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that if we take it in an unworthy manner, we even, some of us are even weak and sick. Some of us are even weak and sick and even sleep. And that word sleep there means death. How many know, do not want communion to be a death time for you? Then all you have to do is if take this time as the ushers are handing out the bread and the juice, take this time just to say, Lord, is there anything in my life that's grieving you or quenching you? And just confess it to him, amen? The only sin God will not forgive is the one unconfessed. Amen? So just confess it. Just tell the Lord I'm sorry and ask him to cover it with the blood. And then we hold the bread and the juice in your hand and we will take communion together as a church.